last uh, the last session of the day, I'm going to ask Rachel and Allison to come up. And there's this great panel discussion. I'm wrapping this up a lot from the plan and the state side. So bringing that conversation back there. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all. We decided to just power through this last session of the day. I hope you'll forgive us for um, skipping a break here. But on, on the plus side, hopefully we'll get out a little bit early. Um, and just thank you all for your stamina today. We've been incredibly impressed with um, the level of engagement and focus um, throughout the day. So really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Rachel Davis. I'm an associate director at the Center for Healthcare uh, Strategies. And um, I am, uh, it feels like a, a good next step for today's conversation might be talking about, Jamie, some of the things that you were just raising and that were coming up, uh, threads that were coming up in other parts of these conversations around opportunities to leverage Medicaid to actually invest in or pay for some of these strategies. So um, I am going to be talking about um, some of the insights that we've seen uh, across the country. A lot of what I'm going to be presenting on today is information that was gleaned from an environmental scan and a report that some of my colleagues recently put together in conjunction with the um, Association for Community Affiliated Plans. And so I'm hoping to give you a little bit of a perspective nationally on, on what we're seeing in this space. Um, and I also just want to say that um, it feels uh, very apt for us to be having this conversation today in Arizona. Um, I, I don't know how much those of you who are local appreciate this, but um, from CHCS's vantage point, we do work uh, you know, with all of the states across the country, and um, uh, our sense is that um, Arizona is nationally recognized for having a very mature and sophisticated managed care environment um, and has really been a national leader in, in understanding how to uh, how to use Medicaid levers and, and uh, partner with managed care entities um, to, to really push the envelope for what can be done um, for, for its beneficiaries. So we're really pleased to be able to have this conversation here today. So um, as I said, a lot of these uh, points that I'm going to be talking about today are from an environmental scan that we recently conducted. And um, I, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, there is a, sort of across the board nationally um, uh, just a recognition that uh, uh, Addressing beneficiary social determinants of health and improving member engagement are key strategies for improving quality and outcomes and lowering costs. I think everybody is on board with that at this point, most everybody. Um, and uh, it's also clear that Medicaid has a number of different levers that can be used to encourage or require providers to do a number of different things uh, to address these social determinants of health. Some of these levers include uh, and, uh, program requirements, um, financial incentives, quality measurement, quality, uh, quality improvement efforts, rate setting. And you know, the point here is there's a number of different mechanisms that Medicaid is able to leverage um, to, to address some of these issues. The lens that we were looking through for this report um, uh, was mostly through 1115 waivers, state, Medi uh, state Medicaid waivers, and also the Medicaid managed care regulations and contracts. That's where we were seeing the majority of um, uh, the, the places where states were taking advantage of, of the Medicaid program to try and advance these efforts. So I wanted to just give um, two examples of some of the 1115 waivers that uh, we saw that we felt like did a nice, uh, are good examples of how states are, are addressing social determinants of health. Um, this one on the left is Oregon, and um, this policy is something that they're likely to be phasing in in 2020. Um, but they'll be taking their high-performing CCOs, which is essentially the Oregon equivalent of MCOs, and giving them um, capitation rates with a higher percentage of profit margins. Um, so those are, that are higher performing, essentially, will be receiving higher capitation rates. And um, the purpose here is really to incentivize the CCOs to invest in social determinants of health in a way that combats premium side, which we know is a concern for, for uh, managed care entities. And so um, the, the state is going to be factoring in plan performance and efficiency on quality 
quality metrics, but they're also going to be looking at how CCOs are investing in health-related services. So they're really pushing um, the CCOs to be thinking about paying for services or, or providing services um, uh, that get at social determinants of health. Another example that we had up here is Massachusetts, um, which has, uh, through its 1115 waiver, allowed ACOs to pay for what have traditionally been non-reimbursed flexible services to address social, social uh, determinants of health. Um, and interestingly, the state is also, um, the state also has the ability to provide a portion of the flexible service funding directly to the social service organizations themselves. And so the idea here obviously is to help build up the infrastructure and the capacity of these um, CBOs and social service entities so that they can be coordinating more effectively with the healthcare system. So um, I also want to talk about some of what we saw in terms of the ways that uh, states were partnering with their managed care entities to address social determinants of health. We certainly saw uh, uh, that an increasing number of states are requiring their Medicaid managed care organizations to address social determinants of health through the, through the contracts. Um, and uh, not just... Um, uh, addressing, but, you know, doing things like screening, um, actively linking patients to providers once um, social determinant of health needs have been identified. I, I think it's fair to say that we also um, saw that most states weren't providing a ton of detail about how managed care organizations can use these flexibilities under the federal law to address social determinants of health. So um, it does seem like there's a little bit of, um, uh, uh, I think there's further opportunity for states and MCOs to be having conversations about what is permitted and how they can maximize the opportunities within, um, within the federal regulations to, to address these issues. Um, and we also did not see um, payment incentives being directly linked to social determinants of health at scale yet. So I think that piece is still um, um, not something that we're seeing a lot of states doing at this point. So in this slide, we're just um, trying to, to sort of provide an overview of the different kinds of social determinant of health type services that man Medicaid managed care is able to cover. And uh, we broke it out into three different buckets, the community care coordination services, which um, you all are, I'm sure, very familiar with a lot of these um, examples here. But so these are services uh, focused on identifying and coordinating community needs, related to um, non-medical services or social determinants of health. Examples of this would be screening and identification, referrals, information sharing, peer support. So these are, um, in terms of financial implications, the rate must be adequate to meet the contract requirements, but these can be covered services and can be included in rate setting and they can count towards the MLR. Um, another bucket that we saw, obviously, was around value-added services. So those, these are additional services that are outside of the Medi Medicaid benefit package, um, but that are also driving at um, social determinants of health. And so uh, the examples here could be meals, exercise or cooking classes. Again, these will count towards the MLR, but they may not be included in rate setting um, unless they're particularly specified in a state plan. And then last but not least are these in lieu of services, which are substitutes for services um, uh, uh, that, um, uh, you know, a health plan might say, you know, this isn't clearly defined in our contract or in the, in the managed care contracts as something that's covered, but we think that this could be equally as effective or uh, even more cost effective as an alternative approach. So an example of that could be respite care as a stay, uh, I'm sorry, respite care as a substitute for inpatient stay or medically tailored meals. Um, you must get state approval for in lieu of services. These can count towards the MLR and they are included in the rate setting. Um, so clearly a, a couple of different avenues by which um, Medicaid is able to pay for some of these investments. 
And I'll just end on this slide here and uh, hopefully give you all a little bit of a flavor of what some of the other states across the country are doing to leverage their managed care contracts to address social determinants of health. Um, I think this North Carolina example is a, a, a relevant one for today's conversation. So um, they have just built into their managed care contracts. So North, many of you may know this. North Carolina is moving into managed care for the first time here. Um, and they will be requiring their plans to use uh, what they're calling the North Carolina resource platform, which is actually a, a, a tech company platform. Um, to identify local community-based resources and for tracking closed-loop referrals. So clearly getting at one of the big needs that we've heard articulated here today. Um, oh, they did. So I don't know. Do you want to say that? Yeah, Mandy Cohen said today on Twitter that they got their first referral today. That's awesome. Well, I know we'll all be watching that one closely to see how that goes. I won't go through all of these here, but um, I do also want to mention, um, as we were preparing for today's conversation and, and sort of skimming the Arizona MCO contracts, um, we were excited to see that there is actually a requirement, there's a current requirement in the Arizona MCO plans, I'm sorry, in the um, MCO contracts, um, that requires health plans to engage members through web-based applications to assist with the self-management of needs. So hopefully this is not news to anybody in the room. Um, but, you know, that all of that is to say that um, you all are clearly thinking about this. There is, I mean, it just could not be spelled out more clearly that there is an opportunity to move on some of what we're hearing today. And so... Um, and, you know, again, I just I think it's really exciting to be having this conversation, and and I hope that um, you know part part of what we've been able to do here today is not only show that um, there's an ecosystem of companies that are thinking about this population and eager to partner with you all, but there's also opportunities and avenues to pursue this within the Medicaid program itself. So um, I will. Turn it over to my colleague Allison here, who's going to facilitate a panel um, and. Uh, if anybody has questions for, for this portion of the presentation, I know we'll have a Q&A section after um, Allison wraps up on the panel. I'm happy to answer any questions at that point. So I'll turn it over to you, Allison. And if the panelists want to come up, that would be great as well. Um, and we can also make the report that Rachel referenced a number of times um, available in the follow-up materials as well. It's a really great resource. Um, that hopefully we will update over time as well. Um, Sandeep. There he is. <laughs> While Sandeep makes his way safely up, up to the panel. <laughs> um, I'll introduce myself quickly. I'm Allison Hamblin, uh, Senior Vice President with the Center for Healthcare Strategies. And for those of you who don't know, the Center for Healthcare Strategies, we're a nonprofit organization uh, based in New Jersey, working nationally. Um, I think we're about the same age as the Arizona Medicaid program. Um, started in the mid '90s. Is that about right? Or yeah. The last last state. Yeah, well, and managed care since the very beginning. Um, and actually, CHCS was founded um, around the same time, and and with the sort of mission and initial very specific focus to help states make the most of the new tools and opportunities that managed care was going to, was, was sort of newly bringing to Medicaid around that time. Um, and so it's wonderful to be here um, in Arizona. We, um, as an organization, still focus um, uh, pretty much exclusively on um, supporting Medicaid efforts to improve outcomes for the members they serve and have the privilege of uh, working with pretty much every state around the country on many of the issues that uh, we've been talking about today and have been um, in recent years keenly interested in helping to facilitate some of the connections between what's going on um, in the entrepreneurial community um, and with all sorts of new and emerging tools and helping um, to sort of connect and facilitate those efforts to, um, to the Medicaid universe. And so we're thrilled to partner with Adaptation Health um, in the context of pulling this event together. And now that my panel is all safely seated um, here in the front of the room, I have to say this is like a, a super panel because there are only three human beings here sitting, but they each have like five different reasons that they could be sitting here given all of the hats that they've worn um, in their careers. And so um, that's part of the reason that we've curated them uh, today. And so obviously our host, Jamie Snyder, um, director of the Access Program here 
in Arizona, and one of her other hats um, has been serving as the Medicaid director in the state of Texas as well, so brings um, the experience of a um, career in Arizona Medicaid um, and the leadership of this program uh, here in your state as well as a perspective having served in that capacity in another very large state, very large Medicaid program as well. Lori Bottrell, um, the same uh, statement I could make about CHCS and the timing of Arizona Medicaid. You've been in the Arizona healthcare landscape for as long as there's been um, an Arizona Medicaid program or the Access program. And your many hats include having served both, uh, well, currently as CEO of Mercy Care Plan, um, but having previously served in a COO capacity, in a CFO capacity, and so brings those um, varied perspectives um, to our panel today, so thank you. And finally, our slow moving, um, <laughs> deliberately moving to the front of the room. Um, third and final, but last but not least, Sandeep Wadwa, Dr. Sandeep Wadwa, who um, is uh, currently Chief Health Officer, um, and wait, there's more to your title, Senior Vice President for Market Innovation um, for Solera Health, um, and uh, Andre also represented Solera uh, earlier today. Um, previously has, among his other hats, served as Medicaid Director in the great state of Colorado. Um, so we have, we have three Medicaid directors on the panel. Um, and also previously was with 3M as well um, as Chief Medical Officer. So a um, little round of applause for our super stellar multi-hat wearing panel. Um, so I'm going to kick it off with a bunch of questions, but it's late in the day, and in order to keep you engaged, I really would welcome you to, to jump in and to participate in the discussion, so please don't be shy. Um, we can, I can be fast on my feet, and we can take it as we go, so let's, let's make this interactive. And so I just want to start off with a question for all of you. Um, we, a lot of this discussion today has been around um, various ways that um, various technologies can help drive value and support the emergence of um, value-based contracting and so forth um, in the Medicaid program. And so just curious to hear from each of you, and Jamie, maybe we can start with you. What does that mean to you in terms of um, adding value to the, how do these partnerships create value or add value? And when you think of with the hat that you're wearing now, mm -hmm. what you're looking for from your plans, what would you be looking for from these partnerships with technology companies to create value in the program? Sure, and when I think about how tech firms can demonstrate value in the healthcare space, I really think of kind of three different things. And I think those, those three um, sort of three sticking points are represented by various parties in this room. I think tech companies can demonstrate value in enhancing communication really between the member and the provider. They can certainly demonstrate value in terms of enhancing coordination between the provider and the plan, and then demonstrate value more at my level in terms of enhancing understanding between the plan and the state or the state program. I think what was interesting about today's discussion is that um, different vendors brought different solutions to the table in terms of hitting on any one of those points. Um, and so I, I think I mentioned to a few folks in the room um, during the breaks, um, it seems like there may be opportunities when you look at the various vendors that we heard from today, and that was only a sampling of the applications that came in, that there may be room for some collaboration collaboration between the folks that are offering solutions and so um, in, in ensuring really that we're attending to each of those three areas that kind of communication point that coordination point and that understanding point and so I'm sure you you heard many of my questions were probably more around the sort of the understanding piece and making sure that at a system level we're using these solutions to move the needle on those really important health outcomes for the bulk of the Medicaid population. Sure. So as a health plan, um, working with multiple providers, one, we wanted to be aware of the fact that providers are often being asked to do multiple things from you know each different health plan, but it also, um, in working with each of them, especially an ACO type provider or large providers that have their own technology, it actually gives us an ability to allow them to try 
different things and see how well those work without just dictating kind of one solution. But I think to Jamie's point, probably one of the bigger things that we get through the technology is that data sharing. So to the extent the health plan holds it, how do we get it closer you know, to the provider who's really providing that care? And then how do we get it back up again so that we can look at it and make sense of some trends that we might be seeing or areas that um, we do need to provide some additional support or interventions as well. So um, I, do, I do agree. I think a lot of these technologies um, you could see you know, many of them um, being able to, to be used and as a quality presented earlier as well, some of the things they're doing, we can really see those results um, compared to somehow some other providers um, are using it as well, so. Great, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, the, the value I see um, that tech can create is, is um, we really are recognizing the role of health-related social supports um, in impacting outcomes. But making that um, tangible for uh, a Medicaid program is, is something that I think is what, what this community can help do. That, that there's a, we, we, we talk a lot about economic insecurity or food insecurity or these different areas that, um, that if addressed can make a difference in health. Um, actually connecting the interventions uh, into a healthcare framework, into, um, into the Medicaid framework um, is, um, I think, what's really exciting. And I, I would, um, you know, as, as a former purchaser, I'm, I'm much more interested in, in how you're improving the health of the population. I, I'm less interested in a way about um, it saving money to the system. Um, and so, and that is, you know, I think sometimes um, sometimes you get very focused on saving costs, and and I think that um, uh, I I would um, I wouldn't lead with that. I, I that I think that leads uh, uh, focus on ninety nine percent of what we buy uh, isn't about cost savings. Um, you know, it's about cost effectiveness, if that. And so I'd I'd encourage you to think about your interventions um, around measurably improving the health of of individuals or populations and. Um, and it doing so efficiently rather than with a cost savings framework. Thank you for that. <clears throat> you mind if I, I follow up on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I think Go one it. of the opportunities, I mean, we talked about this a little bit at Vitalist Conference yesterday on the panel that I participated in around social determinants in particular is that sort of natural alignment of incentives when you talk about quality and cost, right? Um, and so what we're starting to see with some of our health plans um, that in particular are doing a lot of work in the area of housing, when they're able to effectively house individuals, speaking to really that kind of basic social need of the individuals that we serve, they're seeing really incredible outcomes in terms of reductions in costs of care. I think one of our health plans more recently, I'm working with one of our social service providers um, to um, make housing available for a subset of their population, realized a 58% reduction in total cost of care as a result of being able to house some of our enrollees. And I think that's the really exciting work when it comes to social determinants is you're able to meet the need of the individual and really um, recognize um, that savings concurrently. That's great, thank you. You, um, a number of you just now in your responses alluded to something that I couldn't help but think, and some of you may have been thinking the same thing throughout the day, and that is um, there's amazing opportunity here. There's a lot of really compelling solutions that were presented in the room today as well as beyond, beyond those that got to be in the room today. Um, and on the other side of that, there are all of these uh, community-based organizations um, and social service providers who are like being potentially going to be hit with this onslaught of really well-intentioned new partners who are offering them all sorts of new tools and opportunities and maybe even money um, to collaborate in new ways together. Um, and there's like a really daunting perspective um, on that as well. And so I'm curious to hear from each of you on how do we take advantage um, of and leverage the, these um, the opportunities to learn about testing different solutions um, and um, sort of letting a thousand flowers bloom in this field before we know what really works without crushing um, an already fragile community-based um, set of providers and organizations who are not very well funded, um, generally speaking, um, who don't have a ton of infrastructure already. And here we all come marching with our, you know, with our great opportunities. And, 
you know, how do we protect against the risk of um, inadvertently crushing them, either through, you know, any one individual opportunity or through a potentially a kind of a multitude of different opportunities? So, um, yeah, I appreciate you asking that question or talking about that. I know um, I've been in some meetings, again, with Vitalist and others where we've talked about, you know, these agencies going, oh, my gosh, I'm not even staffed to do this. I'm not even used to billing. I'm not used to any of these things. And you're kind of throwing all this at me. And, and while it's exciting, how do you really expect me to manage this? We're a small, you know, organization, you know, trying to do good. And that's something that we want as well. And I do think even forums like this where we're coming together and trying to think through that. I know through Health Current and others, and as I mentioned, Vitalist, how do we find ways to kind of do this in a way that, either creates a roadmap or at least some baseline kind of guidelines that we're working through so we're not, you know, continually just all making up our own stuff. And I know we have that discussion internally as well because we want to throw out a tool, but then we hear everyone else is putting out a tool. So do we wait? Do we try to work together and do something? Um, you know, how do we approach it? So I do think that's um, a real topic for um, all of us, but I appreciate all the collaboration and um, kind of community forums that we do have. Um, I think that's helping us to work through it as well. So. Um, uh, this is, uh, I, I, I think that the work that um, is being proposed here, um, in many cases, um, I would consider uh, to be healthcare. Uh, and, and, um, and if it's healthcare, it should be paid for um, uh, end to end. Uh, that, that the intervention should be funded as part of what we're investing in, uh, and it can compete with um, the unnecessary blood draws, it can compete with unnecessary specialist referrals, uh, and it, it, I posit that it, it um, uh, I'll put my bet on um, investing in, in um, health-related social supports and services uh, versus a system that is, you know, we're, we're trying to, we're, there's so many steps we're doing to kind of fight fee-for-service and, and systems that, and providers that, it, you know, Jamie and I, you know, they're, they're self-interested and social, health-related social supports can be self-interested too. So I, I think there's a financing piece of this, Allison. I think that, that, um, that uh, as we think about um, these interventions, um, if, it's, um, if there's a measurable improvement in, in health um, status, then we should be financing it um, with the same kind of amount, duration, scope, uh, types of parameters that we have for other medical policy, and um, and 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 let let um, let the market, let the providers, let the patients. Uh, you know, there's a way of sorting this stuff out. And I, I 100% agree with that. And I'm going to use this opportunity um, to make my pitch once again around a collaborative effort going back to Lori's point. I mean, we owe it not only um, to the healthcare community, but to the social service community as we forge ahead around social determinants and member engagement to ensure that we mitigate the administrative burden associated with the work that we're doing. That's been Access's commitment in our integration efforts to date, it needs to be our commitment going forward. And I see a real opportunity to do so in our collaborative effort around our waiver renewal that's coming up in 2021. And I know I talked a little bit about this yesterday as well. I see that as a natural opportunity for us to come together. This is really a stepping off point for that conversation around a solution that, that really addresses those constraint points that we see particularly in the social social determinant space around um, the varying tools that are being used to collect information, the varying portals that are being used to refer individuals, and the mechanism, trying to coalesce around a mechanism to really ensure that loop closure so that we know when we refer an individual out that they're actually accessing the services that they need ultimately. And then really looking at Health Current as an opportunity um, and uh, uh, an opportunity and uh, um, a place, a portal where we can store that information and clinicians that are interacting with members on an ongoing basis can use information around social services and social determinants to inform their clinical practice. Uh, just uh, building on it, I thought that, that the, the slide that Rachel showed previously um, with that uh, it had in lieu services and value added services, I can't remember the the first, that, 
there, there was a lot on that slide, but but it was a really powerful slide. Oh, you have it up there. Um, the, 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 I would point your attention to the MLR that that these services can live in the in the MLR, and and for those kind of familiar, a lot of times uh, our our world lives above the line in administrative services, and um, if you can get an MLR kind of. Where, where drugs and, and hospital visits and, and everything else lives, um, it, it, it comes, with, uh, it comes with, with a ton of regulation. So, so that, that's the downside. Uh, it, but, but the upside is, is a level playing field, uh, you, you know, that, that there is a, um, an opportunity to, um, to um, access those services um, in a way that that you know, out of the 3.5 trillion we spend, 3.2 of it is in MLR. Um, so it, it, this is powerful. Medicare is moving in this direction. Uh, you know, with with the supplemental benefits uh, for um, uh, um, people with chronic illness, um, uh, and it's really powerful to see a Medicaid framework here as well for the set of services that challenges that administrative location where I think. A lot of us thought this would live. That's great. Oh, more? No. no? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I want to turn now to addressing um, a, sort of an issue that's an issue anytime you're bringing two sectors together um, or two, two sort of separate worlds together. And we see it increasingly um, at the state level in terms of various efforts to have various state agencies coordinating together. Um, I think many of us would say we've seen it as uh, physical and behavioral health have come together. And that is the need to kind of meld different cultures, different languages, different terminology um, as we try to establish partnerships, as we try to figure out how to work together, establish workflows, and so forth. And it seems that as we're bringing the field of technology and technology partnerships with healthcare organizations and with community-based organizations together that um, there is the potential for a lot of challenges just associated with the different words we use and the um, different ways of business we have, different funding streams and so forth. And just curious for any thoughts from the panel on um, where to date you've seen those types of challenges emerge and to what extent um, you've seen successful approaches to, to navigate those challenges. And maybe, you've, maybe they're not challenges in this case, but curious for your, for your thoughts on that. And Sandeep, maybe you're a good place to start given that you've lived in both of those worlds um, to kick us off. Um, I, well, I'll, I'll kick off a few thoughts. I, I think the, the um, maybe the, the challenge I'm encountering um, with, with, with the CBOs we work with is that um, almost all of them are grant funded or government funded and, and healthcare cares so much about uh, the eligibility of a, of a person. Uh, and, and if that person is eligible for services and, and there's and that that payment is flowing to someone who's eligible for services. And so there is a, it, and that isn't the way a lot of grant funded organizations uh, are organized. They provide services um, uh, to a community. Uh, and, and and really, in many cases, you know, with, they're not tracking um, people and their eligibility, they're, they're tracking need. And so that um, th that's the um, stepping into the healthcare world for the CBOs. I've seen that particular area of, of kind of a paradigm shift to, to um, uh, 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 around services being focused on a person um, and the, the, the guardrails around that. I think that's one of the divides that, um, that we're working through. And, and it, it's it, a lot of times it's, it's easy for a plan to work with a digital only solution. Uh, but I, I, I think it, it's on the innovators to, to figure out how to onboard um, and make that easy for community organizations, that there's a real opportunity to help um, um, connect uh, uh, to a, a person-based system it, w when it's tied with funding. And I think that's what's up, the upside to the CBOs is that um, I, this is a way of uh, sustainable financing. Uh, that that there are it's a it's a it's it's tough to raise money. It's tough to get grants. Uh, it's tough to sustain a grant program after it's done. And and so, but again, the catch is uh, you have to think about individuals in a way that I think is different. 
I would say um, for us, as we look at um, different vendors, um, a critical component is, and I heard this a lot today, is really understanding you know, our members and who we're serving. So when you're sometimes even talking to a national, you know, healthcare company, um, you know, dealing with, you know, commercial, Medicare, Medicaid, but um, we're always really sensitive, right, to some of the things that we talked about today, whether that's, you know, how do you really engage? You may need to try many different methods, many different languages, cultural sensitivity, things like that. So what may work, you know, for, you know, me may not be what works as well for some of our members. And so for me, having a company that understands some of those real challenges and can bring that forward, um, which, as I said, I thought was really well demonstrated today is um, really critical. But then on the flip side, you know, having that, um, you know, data security, standard formats, you know, scalability, ability to get to market quickly, less on upfront costs, more on kind of that ongoing um, kind of outcome based um, is certainly what I, I think all of us um, are looking for. But I do think just having that real sensitivity to, you know, our population and what really works and, and what may not work um, is real important. So. Yeah, and I would definitely echo that sentiment, Lori. I mean, I in fact, I had an opportunity yesterday to sit down with one of their, our health plans, rather, our contracted health plans, and one of their IT folks, and um, they walked us through a new tool that they have to engage members, and it was clear that the, the secret sauce in the equation in terms of really refining that technological solution was putting the member at the center of the conversation. So it was, in fact, the case during that demo that the I, the individuals from the IT department was leading us through the, the technological solution and she was able to speak to um, individual member needs at a level that I found really um, as, you know, really kind of startling and incredible. And so I think, I mean, kudos to the plan and in working with their IT department to better understand, you know, who's at the end of this equation and how can we ensure that they're able to access the care that they need using this technological solution, as well as the others that are engaged with this member, whether it be providers, you know, traditional healthcare providers or, so, or social service providers, they're able to guide that member along the way but I think going back to your point putting the member kind of at the center of that problem-solving effort really helps to ensure that we start to speak a common language and Jamie just to follow up on that because that's actually a really nice segue to to my next question and after that question I want to see if there's any questions in the room or uh, possibly even the the webcast no we're not gonna go there just people in the room um, <laughs> um, but in it, and we had some conversations in, in preparation for, for this event. And I think one of the themes that came out as sort of top of mind in all of this, and I think um, comes out as sort of underscored today, is there's, you know, there's so many cool things we could do, right? I mean, you could look at every single one of the presentations today and say, wow, like that would be awesome to do, right? Like, let's, let's do that, right? But how do we balance the excitement about embracing innovations and, and new opportunities, particularly around member engagement and, and better and more effectively meeting member needs and so forth, um, in a way that ensures that it's additive to the, to the member experience, to the provider experience. Um, remember, this is Medicaid, and we need to make sure that our providers are happy and want to participate in, in the program and so forth. And so, you know, how I'm curious just to hear from each of you how how you think about that concern, and how do we make sure that, that all of this is towards that end goal of um, enhancing the member experience mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of, again, balancing our desires to, to try something new, to try something different, um, to you know, try everything under the sun. Perhaps that could be a good thing um, with, with that sort of overarching concern. Sure, and I think that's a good question, right? That question around disruption. So I would argue that today's event was all about disruption and disruption in a really positive way. Um, but that being said, it's really important as we look at solutions that are really going to advance the way we do business, um, um, probably in a manner that many of us wouldn't have contemplated, say, 10 or 15 
17 years ago um, that we do, again, put the members sort of at the center of that, that discussion. And I think at the end of the day, it really um, comes down to ensuring that as we roll out new solutions, we're providing the level of support that members need, members need rather, providers need, stakeholders need, uh, um, as well as social service agencies. And so I think um, it's something I know our, our presenters didn't have a lot of time to talk about today, given the sort of limited time that they had to um, talk about their solutions. But I think that technical support along the way is really, really critical as well. Um, and and I think you make a great point, Jamie. It is kind of that disruption, and how do we try it in a way that, um, you know, we can make it a pilot, or we can try it, or or at least you know start working our way in um, to really make sure it's adding value. And part of that's really understanding what we're trying to solve for. So it, you know, at some point, we don't just put everything out there. You know, what are we really trying to get to, or what's a need that we really think is out there, and what would providers see as valuable and members see as valuable. So the, so the extent that we can be. As you mentioned, every one of these would be wonderful to be um, implementing, but what are we really trying to solve for? And where can we do it best? As a, you know, what I think about too is what are we doing well as a health plan that we want to keep doing, but what could we turn over to a technology company that if, if they can do it a little bit better and reach that many more and be that much more effective, then I can focus the time for our resources on you know, you know, really talking to a member and spending more time than doing all these outreaches. If we, if we could have technology help solve that and make us, um, you know, better in the role that we're performing, and then ideally making the provider and the member have a better experience um, along the way as well. Um, no, thank you. I, I, um, maybe two quick thoughts. One is, um, uh, I, I I hope this is very disruptive for the providers. Uh, uh, that that I, I I think that there's. 20, 30 percent of spend that that could be shifted to healthy lifestyles and social determinants that's being spent now um, uh, for overuse and waste and and um, you know perpetuating um, uh, revenues uh, um, for low value services. So you're not going to do that without disrupting. Uh, uh, a, a, that that if we're going to move to a a, um, a system that really is. Um, uh, valuing and encouraging and supporting um, uh, that which makes us healthy. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm infinitely more interested in healthy people 2030 than I am in HEDIS or NCQA. You know, you know that 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 that's what I want to be. You know, if we, you know our budget's now eight billion. It was four billion. I, I was much that that as a Medicaid director, uh, I felt much better around those goals than around a bunch of kind of quality goals that seem to be much more focused on, on how providers were holding themselves accountable than what was making people live longer, healthier, happier lives. So, so I, I, I think we are all kind of agreeing around the disruption. The other thing I wanted to just throw out in terms of, of disruption is I've been surprised at how much employers are leaning into social determinants. And I know this conversation is is, 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 is Medicaid, but there's a lot of flow between um, mm -hmm. yeah. Medicaid and the employer market. And, and I've just, and I think there's an energy there where, where employers are recognizing <laughs> that um, low moderate income workers have so many of these needs. And that, that whether it's in the government or service or retail sectors, that, that they're very aware of, of uh, economic insecurity and food insecurity and that, and they're moving and they're demanding that the health plans address it. Um, and they're reconceptualizing, I think, uh, just as we are here with Medicaid. And so I, I think, and, and now I'm even hearing, when, you know, I used to talk about low moderate income and, and $20 and then $30 an hour workers. And, and then employers are saying it, it goes all the way, it doesn't matter. Like, it, you know, these issues um, aren't being met. Um, and we, we, we over, and, and yeah, we, we may have overshot the mark on, on 401k education uh, and, and missed it on credit scores. And so I, I, I just think that, that there's another um, coalition here. Um, and, and, and Jamie, you know, you know I, 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 we, a lot of what we do is, um, you know, we want people to, um, to, to graduate, to, to have, uh, you know, to get out of Medicaid if, if able. And for the people who um, we serve because of a disability, we want them to be as, as healthy and functional as, as they can be. So I just wanted to throw out that thought that, that 
the power of the employer market shouldn't be underestimated in driving innovation and and um, and they can move off cycle it so just uh, Medicaid tends to move uh, when there's a bid uh, you tend to get uh, uh, you tend to get a lot of creativity and energy uh, and, and so uh, if if, if folks, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, the, the HMA newsletter kind of has the weekly RFP. These are, I mean, capitation isn't really around much in our healthcare system except in Medicaid. Like, this is the last bastion of a, of a capitated payment. I mean, I guess some MA, uh, but, but so these are huge swings. I mean, in states are demanding this be addressed then, but so I just, but but the I was just trying to get at um, that was a third point, but but that 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 the employers tend to move off cycle. They're they're they are ready. They move annually, and and just encourage folks to think about um, that as a as a as part of a purchasing uh, force for recognizing the value of your work. Well, I was going to um, congratulate the folks in this room for the really incredible collaboration across the, the plans and the state and, and from every every aspect of this process that the Adaptation Health folks led of defining the problem and um, coming together and, and sort of prioritizing the key issues for this event to focus on and reviewing applications and so forth. And so I do commend you all for that because it's, it's really wonderful collaboration. It doesn't happen everywhere. And so I credit your Medicaid leadership, your access leadership for creating that type of environment here, but also um, just the, the spirit of collaboration that you have here among the plans in the state, which is really powerful. But as I should have anticipated, Sandeep just raised the bar because next year when we do this, apparently we need a bigger space because we should have the key employers um, <laughs> in the room with us. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, uh, potentially some, you know, some un unlikely new partners um, in these conversations who might um, bring their own levers and energy and resources to the conversation. So thank you for raising the bar. Um, to, to my colleagues, do we have time for, for questions? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, you, have, you have a wonderful opportunity here with uh, these colleagues and friends at the front of the room if you want to jump in. Andre, um, I'll give you my mic. Oh, sure. Thanks, that was great. Sandeep, I think I know where you stand on this. Um, I, I think behavioral health, as you guys know, um, I have a certain bias there, but it's related to engagements, related to social determinants, so it's fair game, I think. Uh, what are your thoughts on the shift in some states towards reintegrating behavioral health back in or carving behavioral health back into the managed care benefit structure? And then what do you think about states where um, behavior health remains uh, carved out in a fee-for-service mechanism. Do you have any um, thoughts on what what is the right way to go to achieve the triple aim? No pressure? Yeah, so we're, we're probably all here. Uh, we're, yeah, we're a little biased on the integration. So um, as we've seen, um, even at Mercy Care, um, through our SMI data, which is um, for persons with serious mental illness, we've had an integrated plan since 41014, and we've seen just some really remarkable results, whether it's applying the social determinants of housing and those things, or it's truly just the integration of really more, and I think I heard this earlier today as well, more physical health, health care um, being utilized while not really negatively impacting the behavioral health side of it. We've shared some information, and I know other plans have it as well, that we've been able to look at. So I think across all our populations um, where we can be integrated, that's certainly um, where we support. So, Yeah, and Andre, I think you know, um, the Arizona Medicaid program has been engaged at, in a 10-plus year journey to integrate behavioral health services and physical health services. Um, kind of to Lori's point, uh, more recently, we actually completed an evaluation of one of our initial integration efforts, um, specifically for individuals determined to have serious mental illness in Maricopa County. And just to give you a sense of the value of that integration effort, we saw a 10% reduction in ED 
utilization, a 13% reduction in readmissions. And when it comes to members' experience of care, we saw a 61% increase in members' perception of care coordination. Yeah, and so I think that really speaks for itself. We're really excited to see those outcomes. We know that we still have work to do around our integrated care model. And I think we see this discussion is sort of the next stage um, in that, that uh, conversation around um, whole person health. So natural extension of what we've been doing. Uh, maybe one, one other thought on the, the uh, behavioral health. And so I, I, I think we're, we're recognizing the role of, of healthy lifestyles in addressing physical health. Um, and and that, that we've, we're, 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 we've made, we're making those investments around um, um, uh, weight, activity, nutrition. I, I think there's a, a comparable activity to go upstream on f behavioral health too. And that, that uh, um, uh, uh, I think we're starting appropriately so uh, around high cost, high needs and, and people with SMI, but, but I worry tremendously about stress resiliency conduct disorders, the, the needs of, of low-income children, and what are we doing to really invest in community mental health interventions, and what's the role of technology in, in uh, going upstream? Um, a lot of mental health is environmental, um, and, and it starts early, and it starts, um, and there's a stress of poverty, and so I, I think there's a real opportunity and, and real excitement in this field around how we can reach people um, um, uh, upstream um, uh, uh, where it may not be the dominant organizing condition, but it is impairing uh, what, what a person uh, and their family, uh, you know, are, are feeling. So I think um, that, that may be an area that I think uh, is, is uh, one that, that we can, um, we can uh, focus on as well. Hi, uh, great panel. Uh, Dave Fukusawa, the Kresge Foundation. Now, I, I go to a lot of, I lead the health program there, but I, I go to a lot of these kind of meetings and about the triple aim and social determinants. It's something we've pushed for the last 10 years, but I'm actually gonna sort of come off of Sandeep's last remark because one of the other things we have at Kresge is a human services team, which has allowed me, and it's, it's a very long story, to understand more deeply sort of that system and, and, and my contention is that health people don't under, really understand that system. Uh, and there's a lot of money over there too. Uh, and so in some ways my question is, is almost more for the companies here than, than for you guys, although I think it is an important state question uh, in, in that um, there's, the, the social determinants flow across all kinds of social problems, including education, um, which everyone frets about. Um, uh, including housing, which we've talked about, and so all these other, other areas. And there's a lot of money in that social sector, which goes basically without the encumbrances of a lot of the regulatory issues around Medicaid, for example. Uh, a lot of that is strict, you can pretty much straight contract, you know, for services based on outcomes. Uh, and to me, there's a big opportunity to sort of think very broadly about some of this same technology across a number of issues, including education, uh, which, I, which I think is the last big, big area to sort of think about. Uh, and a little story, uh, so Kim and I have became familiar with another company who is not here, uh, that, that one of the, what their data showed was that a lot of members were showing up at these social service agencies hidden from, from the plans. And because the plans were trying to find these people, but they were showing up by the scores <laughs> In these CBOs, uh, and and you know we need to figure out a way to come you know not just from the plan to the CBO but vice versa, because there's a lot of stuff going on. People are looking for solutions to their lives as it's occurring to them. If it's a housing problem, they're going to go to a housing. They're not going to go to the the ER room until they get sick. So I'm, I'm just it's just one of those things that I think we need to sort of think more broadly and comprehensively about. I would just add, um, moderator prerogative, that I'm um, sort of connecting or further connecting those two points. I think an area where we're seeing a lot of that or we'll see more is in the early childhood 
space, there's a lot of interest right now in terms of stronger connections between Medicaid and early childhood and healthcare and early childhood. Um, and so those um, seem to be great opportunities for <coughs> leveraging some of the funding sources and, and levers across um, the education sector Can as I well. Share a story? I'm going to share a story. Just it's not that appropriate, but but um, um, I, I I I earnestly tried to get um, uh, school buses to not drop kids in front of uh, uh, schools. Uh, you know, like make them walk uh, 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 two blocks, four blocks. Like, um, or do you want me to build a ramp? I can just roll a kid into um, into the classroom. Uh, but then I got yelled at. Um, you know. State shouldn't interfere, but but it it it, it it's a fact. It, there's so much richness there in in so many communities. Medicaid is is the single payer. I mean, I'll just say it. I mean it, it, that that it, it, and when I looked at free and reduced lunch percentages, and and you'd, there are school districts that are 75, 90 yeah. percent. They're all in Medicaid. I, you know, we are so I, we've got a relationship with that that zip code, that geography. Uh, that that I think um, you know I you know should be unbound from the eligibility uh, you, where you could do a community investment uh, and 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 I I hear you David on, in terms of the the actual support and I, I, there's a lot there to unpack in terms of 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 our of our market power I mean Medicaid is the market maker for newborn care and and. We're kind of, you know, largely for, for children care too, um, you know, the dominant payer of, of children care. And, and I don't know if we use that market power to impact the, the you know, the trajectories. I mean, almost every unhealthy lifestyle begins before 18. Uh, you know, you just, if you're going to use tobacco, if you're going to have a trajectory for being overweight. And, and, and so I, 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 I just think that we've got so much purchasing power if we start to think of ourselves as uh, community health um, um, uh, promoters and funders, uh, that that I think you're getting at that from an education, a built environment, um, uh, from a justice point of view. There's a, a lot we could be doing. I was just medical provider side and it's like there's a conversation that we need to have about this yeah and I, I would agree and I you know kind of to to your point I think it's no longer about and I, I mentioned this yesterday as well no longer about taking care of the individual it's really about supporting and lifting up communities I think the challenge for us is around partnering with um, entities that we haven't traditionally partnered with and trying to find that common language um, we've been fortunate in Arizona over the course of the last couple of years to receive some state funding um, to sort of facilitate those those efforts. One of the areas is um, around the provision of behavioral health services in schools. And so our plans, we're already engaged on that front, but certainly are enhancing their efforts um, to ensure that they're co-locating services within those educational environments and meeting kids where they're at. In addition, um, with our, our state um, targeted response and state opioid response grants, we're investing some money, understanding that the root of the issue is often around trauma and trauma-informed care. And so making sure that we're attending kind of to those sort of the foundation of the problem um, but again it's 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 forcing us to have conversations that we haven't historically had but they're really important conversations well and I was just gonna mention that we we also will have a donut hole here too as our as our communities age right we're also seeing the exact same thing in the elderly the dual population right more and more duels going on the ranks and higher and higher cost as end-of-life care and long-term compounded poor health outcomes. But my question was really around um, thinking about how we reverse engineer or think of creative ways to evaluate um, standard, you know, um, social determinative health interventions. Because I think evaluation is often where we get stuck. It's like easy to talk about what are people doing and how is it getting done, but to think about what is actually working based upon the data and where do we need to pivot and how quickly can we be flexible enough to pivot? Um, I, I, I think there are, are a series of validated measures. They're just not in our industry. So, so the, the USDA 
has a two-question food insecurity um, uh, measure that 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 now the pediatricians I think maybe they, it has some funny history but 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 I think there are these different tools I guess what I'm I'm um, I mean, on my knees about is let's lo use the validated measures from these other um, sectors and 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 th let that be the outcome of interest uh, uh, that that there's um, there's a a, a a nice social isolation um, metric, I think, out of UCLA. There's the food insecurity metric. There's the, uh, it, when I think about falls prevention, I'm a geriatrician. I haven't referred a single patient ever to a community-based falls prevention program. I mean, I've been practicing 20 years. I'll send them to PT or OT, a physical therapy OT, but I don't send them to the YMCA or the Area Agency on Aging. It's, I mean, we haven't, we haven't gone the last mile, but but when we get there, the, the, you know, the CDCs, there's a measure there. So I, I guess I'm, I'm I, I think we can, we always talk about beg, borrow, steal other people's in Medicaid. It's like our, our so I, th I think we're, we're expanding that to um, to some other segments. So I, I'm hopeful. I mean, you know, I think if we try and make it look like us and put it into kind of this healthcare framework, I, you know. Last one or one yeah. more? Yeah. I will do one more right, question. One more Hi, this is Wolf uh, Schlagman from Care Angel. So we um, had worked with actually ARP, the foundation. They actually gave us a $50,000 grant uh, for isolation. So we then went in turn, um, went to talk to a number of area agencies on aging. And we were looking to give the money away, literally like provide our services to all these families. And what we found is that some of them were structured to where they would get the dollars but each of the individual CBOs, uh, you know, organizations would make their own choice of what they wanted to do. Yeah. So it was so fragmented that they, and then each one, like literally, you know, from a, from an, uh, a contracting standpoint, it was, became so convoluted that we would have just spent all the money on contracting on lawyers just to be able to give away the service that we were trying to provide, you know, which is a, you know, the, the, kind of a virtual caregiver to help assist and kind of connect the dots. And, so what we found is that the, each individual CBO just kind of, you know, has to make the decisions about what they're going to do, and there's no organization that was kind of coordinating that. So even though we got this, you know, grant, the dollars to, to help them, they could not, you know, kind of figure out how to get it done because it was so fragmented. Each one of them only was taken care of X amount of hundreds of families. So it became really, so that's kind of a challenge I see sometimes with, if you don't have somebody driving the, the, sta the standards, to what type of programs should be implemented? Um, well, no, great question, and, and uh, one that that I think you're you're spot on. I guess we've um, um, we've really been trying to promote a hub and spoke model, leveraging generally state based associations. So so we, we get lobbied hard by all of our provider groups. Uh, you know, Jamie. Now you know maybe I'll come knocking now out of the. I'm sure I will. <laughs> You have a business card, uh, but uh, um, but but Wolf, th there's there's power in that aggregation at the associations level, and 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 so so um, Oregon Wellness Network in in Oregon uh, is the uh, kind of the the contracting arm for all the AAAs in Oregon, and, and I, I, we're, we're there. There's something to be said for scale, uh, and 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 having. That central organization that that is somewhat of an administrative coordinator uh, and that knows the ropes and knows the people. Uh, so, um, but Wolf, I think you're you're it, it's it's hard. It's it's costly. It's uh, it isn't in the. It's not what's being rewarded. Uh, so I, I I appreciate you raising that. Yeah, and I would just add, I think we're you know we heard some some um, approaches today to sort of cultivating those more professionalized networks across um, community-based organizations, and we're seeing that elsewhere in the country as well. Um, and it seems it's sort of parallel in my mind to what we're seeing with behavioral health providers across the country. Andre, to your point, where um, behavioral health is coming in more to mainstream managed care, you're seeing more IPAs and networks forming of um, what maybe historically was more of a mom and pop. Um, or cottage industry or sort of less um, networked um, set of providers. And I think we'll see the same thing happening on the, the community-based organization side. While I'm still holding the mic, because I know this is like my last second, I just want to um, thank uh, our partners at Adaptation Health for letting us be a part of this event and thank Jamie and the Access team as well. This has been an incredibly rich discussion. Thank you to our panel. You were amazing. 
thank you all. I'm going to hand it over to Jamie for just a couple of closing remarks. Um, and thank everybody for being here. It, just to echo Allison's point, it is not usual that you see this level of collaboration between everybody in this ecosystem together in one room. So I think that's a, a tribute to the organization and to Jamie and, and to bringing everybody together. Well, and really a tribute to everyone in the room. We are very fortunate in Arizona to have an incredibly strong, a collaborative community um, of, of partners, both uh, private sector, public sector, and it's something we've really long valued in the Medicaid program in Arizona. I want to thank you all for joining us today. As I mentioned on the panel, we really do see this as just a beginning, really a jumping off point for a bigger conversation that we need to have in Arizona around our waiver renewal in 2021. Tremendous opportunity. I want to thank the vendors that joined us today. I think um, certainly opened my eyes to the full range of solutions that we could be looking at. And we look at, uh, we really look forward to continuing to partner with you over the coming years around um, social determinants of health and digital member engagement. And so encourage continued conversation. Um, we'll be working closely with our partner Vitalist as a convener of this discussion on an ongoing basis um, and always feel free to reach out to us if you feel like we're not tapping into what the real need is. I think as Lori said on the panel, we need to ultimately coalesce around kind of that problem statement as we look at solutions down the road. And so, so that, that uh, effort is going to be reliant upon all of us and, and reliant upon all of your contributions. So thank you again for joining us today and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.